we are trying to prepare ourselves for Easter, and so we're doing that with a series that uh, simply called Witnesses of the Resurrection. Uh, we've been looking at some of the different people who actually saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Uh, one of the, p- the people we just dealt with last week was uh, John, who actually saw Jesus on the island of Patmos. Again, quite some time after Jesus had risen from the dead. John, of course, had a number of experiences seeing Jesus, didn't he? So he was there. He was with Peter when they heard the tomb was empty and when they ran to look. He looks in. Peter rushes in. The, he was there when he was with the disciples, all who were doubting. Oh, we don't believe he's risen. The women have said that he's risen, but this is crazy. And Jesus shows up inside the room where they're at. He was there when he was walking on the beach with Peter, when Peter is uh, invited to again uh, say that he loves Jesus. And he was there when Jesus ascended up into heaven. He was there when other people were re- uh, were present the 500 or more people saw Jesus risen from the dead and John was with him at those events but John also was there then on the island of Patmos when Jesus revealed himself to him in preparation for his second coming which was quite an incredible vision you find a lot of those details in Revelation if you want to read about what John saw Mary Magdalene witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ and and Mary is a very special lady from uh, a lady that got that Christ had actually cast seven demons out of her totally made over by by Jesus Christ and because of that Jesus is so incredible so special to to her so she's there with some of the other ladies she, remember she's the one with um, with Mary Jesus' mother and Clopas who are standing there watching as Jesus dies on the cross. She's there and hears hears all the tears and all the pain and all the anguish of Mary and sees all the anguish of Jesus Christ as well. Mary's then with some of the other ladies has gone to the tomb on Sunday morning and has taken the spices because she's going to finish the entombment, if you will, of Jesus. Mary's the one who's there. Mary's the one who sees the angel and doesn't know why these angels are sitting there inside the tomb. In fact, I don't know if she even recognized them as angels. She just knows Jesus' body's gone and somebody's taken it. Mary's the one who goes back to the disciples and says, his body's been stolen. I don't know where they've taken it. She comes back, gets there after Peter and John have gotten to the tomb and left and, and gets there after them and, and looks in and again realizes he's not there. And then the gardener, in her eyes because she's so distraught that this man turns behind her and says Mary actually first off said you know where are you what, what who are you looking for and then he, she, she responds I'm looking for Jesus they've taken him where have you taken him and that's when then Jesus says Mary and she recognizes it's the Lord it's the Messiah he's risen from the dead witnesses of the resurrection today we're looking at Saul Saul, who was so committed to his faith and his rejection of Jesus that he persecuted the early church. Saul, the kids were getting it kind of right, weren't they? I, I'm not sure that he was angry when, they saw, when he saw Jesus. I think he was pretty distraught. But he was sure angry at all the people who believed that Jesus had risen and angry at Jesus himself before he sees him there on the road to Damascus. And why is he on, on going to Damascus? He's on a mission, and the mission is to go arrest more Christians, more people of the way, more followers of Jesus Christ. His mission is to destroy this movement that's gotten way out of hand, this blasphemer who was crucified, his body's gone, and people are saying he's alive, and he's got to disprove it and end this anarchy. And that's why he's headed to Damascus. He actually has letters with him from the high priest that give him permission to arrest and, if necessary, kill followers of Jesus Christ, followers of the way. And as he's walking down the road, riding perhaps, I'm guessing, with his friends who are heading there with him, an entourage, I'm sure, of soldiers from the high priest and others that are there to go and arrest more Christians as he's going there. And by the way, notice, in the middle of the day, Christ comes to him. When you think of people who saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead, have you thought of Saul of Tarsus? as one who actually saw 
Jesus risen from the dead. By the way, that'll be a very important point that hopefully I'll remember to bring back up to you in a few moments. Saul was a man who violently, violently opposed Christianity. He was there, you might remember, when Stephen was stoned, the first martyr in the church. And, it, and Scripture tells us that Saul was actually consenting to the death of Stephen. He's actually holding the coats of the men who are doing the stoning. That puts him in a place of authority. He was the one who was even granting them permission to stone this man because of his blasphemy. Acts 8, 1 to 3 says, And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And we find that not only put them in prison, had them killed. Chapter 9 then goes on, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still, listen to this, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Do people know that he's opposing Christians? Oh, my goodness. The, the word is getting out. Watch out for Saul of Tarsus. He's horrible. He's mean-spirited. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he didn't care, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. He's got to end this fire that's burning, this lie that's being spread. Acts 22, G, Paul, at that point, and remember, he's renamed by God himself from Saul to Paul. Paul is telling his own story. In fact, he'll do this in Acts 22 and again in Acts 26. Twice he went in Acts 26. He says, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. In chapter 26, verse 9, he says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. <clears throat> And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. You don't hear any humility there, do you? This is a man who's passionate, so committed to his cause that he is committed to killing Christians simply because he believes it's not true. Not, not just disagreeing. Not, this is not just a theological opinion. He is committed to the fact that this cannot be true. Jesus Christ cannot be the Messiah, and he can't be risen from the dead, and we've got to kill anybody who believes that he has. He goes on. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I tried to force them to blaspheme. Now, in his mind, it was blasphemy. He wanted them to say that Jesus was God. And they would say it because they believed it. And they would die simply because this religious man named Saul was committed to cleansing the, their times of anyone who, who blasphemed by calling Jesus God. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Strong words, isn't it? Murderous threats, possessed with, with destroying them and persecuting them. Saul was violently, strongly, with every ounce of his being committed to destroying Christianity. Do you get the point he's a little bit in opposition? A little bit negative. And as he's going down the road to Damascus, there to, to arrest and kill Christians, he's blinded along the way. As he neared Damascus on his journey, this is verse 3, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. By the way, if you take note, I'm reading from Acts. Who wrote Acts? Luke wrote Acts. That's important if you're in, when you watch the movie. 
if you go see the movie, because if you saw Jim Cavaziel, he's playing the part of Luke. It's Luke who goes to Rome to write down the story of Paul's life. In fact, if you start at the right beginning, Paul actually says, I'm all alone here except for Luke is the only one with me. Luke's the only one with me. Dr. Luke converted to Christ, to Christ and Christianity. Luke is telling the story. Well, so we're looking at the, the, at the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Interesting enough, he's looking at an apostle, which he is Paul of, or Saul of Tarsus. As he neared, neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? <clears throat> Saul asked. Lord, I, I don't know what crisis is taking place right now, but you do. Uh, you know who's in need. You know exactly what's going on. And I pray that your spirit would bring comfort and encouragement and blessing and healing to whoever's in crisis. I thank you, God, that you're traveling with those who are going to take mercy and kindness. I pray that you give them wisdom when they get on scene. And Jesus put somebody there that can show whoever is in need that you love them. In Christ's name, amen. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And with that, the conversation's over. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. For three days, blinded by this bright light, <clears throat> he has just been talking to a voice. Where's the voice coming from? Did you take note? The men actually hear the voice. Now, in another place, it says they don't understand. And, and if right now, if we had somebody speaking um, um, Brazilian, or excuse me, Portuguese, how many of you would understand? You might have understand part of it, right? Salsa, because Spanish and Portuguese are similar. But most of us wouldn't have any comprehension of somebody who's speech, speaking um, Portuguese right here, right now. But we'd know that somebody was speaking, wouldn't we? And when we say, oh, they're speaking words too. And we might even hear them say something like Jesus or something like that. Oh, they sing, they're saying something about Jesus. But we wouldn't know, would we? If we didn't have, understand the language. And so the men are hearing the voice but, and they've seen the bright light, but they do not know what is being said. However, and we'll watch, the, watch this one. There, Saul is speaking, right? Could they hear his voice? Of course they could, Right? It, he's sitting right there. If, if, if somebody starts talking right now during worship, won't you all be able to hear that person? Yes. Yeah. You might not make out everything that they're saying, but you're going to be able to hear what somebody's saying. They're hearing what, Paul, what Saul is saying. Who are you, Lord? And they're like, you know, what's he doing? <laughs> and, and he's talking to that voice, and the voice seems to be talking to him. And, you know, and, and oh, oh, he's He's done. They've seen the light. Saul's responded to the voice. The voice has identified himself as who? Jesus. I am, oh my, there's the name of God. I am Jesus, whom you, you, Saul, were persecuting. The companions hear it. They don't understand what's going on. The light has been incredible. In fact, nine, Acts 9, 7 says, The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Uh, by the way, there's, there's no uh, technological tools that back then to, uh, to have a sound come from somewhere else, right? We could do that today, right? We uh, listen to Theo um, when he's asleep right now because he's up there at our house this weekend. And so last night, we were awoken several times as we started to hear him cry. Why? Because we have uh, this little microphone and a little walkie-talkie in, in the room where he's at and one in our room, and um, you can hear things. Now, watch out if you come over to our house and you're talking in the other room. We might be listening. I say that because um, Jen and Phil have been, had, had, had their house up for sale, and they have a, actually a video camera in Theo's room. 
so that they can see. They, they actually watch him when he's sleeping and all. Well, when there were people coming through to look at their house to see if it, what it was like, they left the video camera turned on. They could hear what people were saying about their house. In fact, the realtor says, you know they're listening, don't you? <laughs> so you just got to watch out. You never know now. And, I, and my, my understanding is if it's in your own house and somebody's talking in your own microphone, that's legal, by the way. That's not a telephone call. So just watch out. <laughs> just warning you. The men saw the light and they heard the voice. Acts 22, 9 says, my companions saw the light. But they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Take note. When did the light appear? At noon, in the middle of the day. And the light, oh my, the light is brighter than the sun. The light that shines on Saul, that gets his attention, that puts him down on the ground, that is in what is going on here, that light that's got him down now on the ground with eyes closed, that light is brighter than the sun. Oh my folks, there's something special there. By the way, do you remember last week when we talked about John and his vision of heaven? And what does Revelation say? How do we have light in heaven? Not because of the sun, S-U-N. Not because of the moon and the stars, but because of Jesus who gives the light to heaven. God is the light. The light appears at noon. It, it, it occurred openly on a public highway. Anyone that was there could have seen the light. It, and the light was brighter than the sun, and it blinds Paul, but not his companions, interesting as well. Incidentally, folks, I, I personally think that Paul is one of the best evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But if you want to test the, the, Paul's truth, veracity, did he really see all this? Did this really happen? Guess who you would have asked? You would have asked these guys. Because these guys, like Saul of Tarsus, are on their way to Damascus to catch and kill Christians. They're committed like he is. They're all in opposition to Christianity like he is. And they could, would have obviously said, oh, that didn't happen. There was no bright light. Saul just fell off his horse, bumped his head, and, you know, had some kind of weird experience, you know, mumbling away. And, you know, and then he couldn't see, so we took him into Damascus. Wouldn't they come tell something like that? But see, they can't because they know the truth. That Saul has had an experience that's unbelievable. They've seen the light themselves. They've heard a voice. They have no idea what's going on. And Saul is blinded, and they take him into Damascus. And I got a feeling that they left him there and headed back because their leader was no longer able to keep them moving. And while in Damascus, what happens? Verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord. <laughs> These things don't happen all the time, right? I mean, do, do you have God calling you in the middle of the night, waking you up? It doesn't happen very often. Ananias, yes, Lord. <laughs> the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Don't you love how specific God is? <laughs> Go find that guy from, Dem from, from Jerusalem that just came to town. No, no, he's on Straight Street at Judas's house. Here's the address. You, know, you, he, you didn't need Google at that time, okay? Because, because God's going to direct you right to the place. And so go, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, oh, by the way, Ananias, I've already prepared the way for you. <laughs> I've already got things going, okay? Ananias, get this. I've already been talking to Saul. And I've told him in a vision, I better read it. <clears throat> in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So, Ananias, uh, you got, you're going to have some fun, man. You're going to go pray over Saul of Tarsus. You're going to pray on his eyes. You're going to heal him from his blindness. And I've already told him you're coming. 
Now, there's a problem that Ananias has. He says, can I get out of this? <laughs> Maybe, God, you don't know. You know, you're a long ways away. You don't know all the details here. But Saul has come here. I've heard all the reports. Well, let me read again. I've heard many, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. And you want me to go see him? <laughs> and if he is blind, could we just leave him that way? <laughs> okay, I, I don't mind seeing him, but I don't want him to see me. <laughs> But the Lord said to Ananias, don't you love the Lord's commands when they come in one word? Go! <laughs> yes, sir, right away, sir. <laughs> Sometimes we need to have those kinds of instructions, and, and some of us aren't following when he says go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Ananias, I'm in charge here. I've been working on this guy, and I've got responsibility for him. Oh, and by the way, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Don't worry about it, Ananias. Uh, like I told you, here's the address. He's, uh, he's waiting for you. You don't need to worry about him. He's, he's going to suffer for me. I've already chosen him. He's going to have a dramatic life change right now, and you're going to be a part of it. Ananias, don't miss out this opportunity. Go. This is a divine appointment, Ananias. You're going to get the privilege to literally be a part of the conversion of one of my greatest evangelists that's going to live in all of time. You're going to be able to, to touch one of my most important apostles. He's going to be speaking to the Gentiles, and along his journey of speaking to the Gentiles, and bringing many people to Christ and setting up churches all over the known world, he is going to suffer, I promise you. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay? He's going to experience some pain along the journey. He'll get his. Don't worry about that, Ananias. But you have a divine appointment. Get on over there to Straight Street. It's interesting, isn't it? Ananias knows Saul. It was all about him. And understandably, he's reluctant to go see Saul. But God says, what? Well, if you feel like it, Ananias, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I could probably find somebody else if you don't want to do this. Um, you know, I, I, I know I've already told him you're coming, but we'll just call him up and tell him somebody else is going to be there. <laughs> go, Ananias! <laughs> I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Saul will suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. But he won't do it as a form of punishment. He'll do it out of conviction. He will suffer because of the fact that he has seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead and he cannot do anything but tell others about Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. At 40 you die, so they stop at 39 so they can just take you right there to that last, last little inch of death and now you just get to suffer. Okay, these lashes are not just little whoopings. These are not like ha happy birthday spankings. These are with a whip that tears apart your flesh. And that's Saul. He's experienced that 34, five different times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. He actually was stoned. They thought, they thought he was dead. He actually probably was dead. Um, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea with a whole band of other people from the ship. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. 
And we get afraid to tell somebody about Jesus because they might not like what we say. Why would Saul go through all this agony? I mean, seriously, how, how, how crazy do you have to be? Why? Why would he be willing to face so much pain and hardship and difficulty? Here it is, because of one fact, because he had seen the risen Jesus Christ with his own eyes. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Why is he willing to face all this? Because he's seen Jesus risen from the dead. Saul's life is changed by the miracles that he ex experienced. He's been talking to Jesus, oh my. He, he's seen this bright light that's blinded him. And, and now suddenly, because Ananias comes and prays over him, shackles, these things fall off of his eyes, literally. And now he can see. And then all kinds of other miracles along the journey as he served Jesus. And you know what? There would be another way of proving that Saul didn't see Jesus. The one evidence that you are an apostle is you have to have seen Christ risen from the dead. If you're not one of those who's seen Christ risen from the dead, you're not an apostle. You're not one of those sent out as eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The disciples were now apostles who had seen him risen from the dead. Well, look at this one, 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother also wrote you, with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other disciples to their own destruction. What's Peter saying? He says, I, I believe Peter. I believe Paul. He's real. He's an apostle. Galatians 2.9, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They actually said, you're, a, you're a, an apostle, Paul. What made him an apostle? He had seen the resurrected Christ. What did Paul preach, by the way? Paul preached one message again and again and again. When he, when he realized that arguing didn't work in, in Greece, he says, I'm just going to pe preach Christ crucified. So you go back to 1 Corinthians 15. He says, not by the grace of God, I am what I am. And, excuse me, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And it is, his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. He said, uh, you hear what he's saying here? Okay, first off, if, if what I've been preaching, that he is risen from the dead, didn't happen, uh, your faith, your belief, 
is futile. But not only that, I've been lying. He's calling himself a liar if Jesus Christ isn't risen from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we're of all people most to be pitied. Why does he say that? Oh my, to be a Christian in that day was not a nice thing. You suffered intense persecution. You lost jobs. You were not accepted. You were not welcomed. You were blamed like, a, like Caesar did for the, the burning of Rome. I mean, all kinds of things. Christians were just uh, distasteful. So to be a Christian was something to be pitied if Jesus is not risen from the dead. But verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jumping ahead to verse 42. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Folks, do you believe this? Because we, like the disciples, sometimes doubt, don't we? We sometimes say, well, is there really life after death? Is there really resurrection? Verse 51, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Folks, Paul believed that when you die, you rise from the dead. Through Jesus Christ. And as I've been kind of thinking about this message, I, I really, I think, first off, if you need evidence that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, look at Saul of Tarsus. The, the dramatic change in his life, it just wouldn't have happened. I'm sorry. This guy was so committed that he was violent in his behavior, in his opposition to Jesus Christ. So what else could, you, could, could impossibly explain the change in his life, the willingness to suffer and die, to be imprisoned and go through all kinds of persecution, except for one fact, this man who believed that Jesus had not been God and had blasphemed, the one fact that has changed is Jesus is risen from the dead and proven to Saul that he's son of God, the Messiah. And Saul said, I've got to change my life. I guess the thing that hits me is this. First off, we may need that evidence, that reminder that, that sometimes we just need some proof that Jesus Christ is risen and that he is alive and there's life after death. Because sometimes we doubt. But there's something else here. Have you had a personal encounter with the risen Jesus Christ? Have you personally encountered the risen Jesus Christ? If you haven't, he's here. He's wanting you to see him. He's trying everything he can to give you evidence and proof that he is who he said he was. He has demonstrated his love for you, his acceptance of you, and he's trying to tell you once again, God loved the world so much that he gave me his only son that if you believe in him, you'll have everlasting life. Have you had that personal encounter with Jesus Christ? And some of you say, oh, yeah, yeah, Bill, that's an old hat. You know, I've been Christian for 39 years. Really? And if so, are you driven? Are you driven by that resurrection? Is your life driven by the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, that Jesus Christ dwell, and his spirit dwells within you, that Jesus Christ wants you to live for him, that Jesus Christ wants you to do all you can to prepare to go to heaven, that Jesus Christ wants to cleanse you and make you into a new person, that Jesus Christ wants to change the world around you, that Jesus Christ might be calling you like he did Ananias to go to somebody who doesn't believe. Are you driven to do that? it may be the test that you need to look at and say, all right, I've encountered 
but what have I done with Jesus? Now, I think Saul's conversion may be the single most compelling evidence that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. But what will compel you more is if you, if you pursue Jesus Christ. In fact, we're going to show a little clip from the movie I Can Only Imagine. I Can Only Imagine is a movie that's coming out this week. You're like, man, Bill, are you getting a profit off of these movies or something? I wish. <laughs> but, I, but I thought this was an interesting uh, uh, clip to show you because it, it, I Can Only Imagine is the song that, um, whoops, that, that Bart Millard, lead singer with Mercy Me. Most of us have followed Mercy Me. They've had like 26 um, number one bestsellers and crazy good music. Um, and Bart is uh, the lead singer and one of the, the main authors and composers of songs for Mercy Me. He wrote the song, I Can Only Imagine, to be sung at his father's funeral. When, when Bart was a freshman in high school, his dad came down with cancer. One of his friends uh, with Mercy Me said, Bart, you need to write what's in your heart. He says, he says well, I got hurt. I've got this pain. Because Bart grew up in an extremely abusive home with his dad. Mom left when he was a young boy, and, and he, was, he was literally stuck with dad who was just a hostile, mean-spirited man. But because of cancer, Bart's dad came to know Christ. And Bart will say that the dramatic change, like Saul, the dramatic change in dad's life changed his life as well. So that he was able, with all the meanness, unforgiveness, unkindness and all, because of what Jesus did in his dad's life, he was able to write this song in moments. Literally, in something like 10 minutes, he wrote the song, I Can Only Imagine. You know, this is a platinum. This is it's incredible what this song has done. I can only imagine. As he imagines heaven where his father is at. And so he sings this song at his dad's funeral as a witness to the power of the resurrection and the forgiveness that Jesus Christ buys for us. Take a look at this clip. Hi everyone, this is Bart Miller from Mercy Me. Did you know that there's a new movie coming out based on the story behind our song, I Can Only Imagine? Yeah, it's a movie of my childhood and my relationship with my abusive father who came to know Christ uh, when I was in high school and he's diagnosed with cancer. My father's played by Dennis Quaid. My grandmother who named the band said, Mercy Me, Get a Real Job is played by Cloris Leachman. My music teacher is Priscilla Shire and our manager is played by Trace Atkins. The guy that plays me is J. Michael Finley who was Jean Valjean and Les Mis on Broadway before he took this part. So needless to say, we had to spend a few days teaching him how to dumb his singing way down. So anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Be sure to check out, I can only imagine, in theaters in March of 2018. It's an amazing song. It just kind of happened. It took about 10 minutes, I guess. Bart, you didn't write this song in 10 minutes. It took a lifetime. How'd you do this? You know, I've never told anybody my story. When I was uh, 11 years old, life was tough. Where's mama? She's gone. She don't want me no more. And she don't want you neither. And I've always loved music. And I found some songs that I just, I held on to. They gave me hope. Mercy me, that can't be his real voice. Because I needed it. Dad, I can do this. No, you can't. And you're going to blink your eyes, and you're going to realize that life has gotten you nowhere because you chased some stupid dream. I can. I'm leaving. 
Shit. I want you to know that I pray for you all the time. And I hope that you find whatever it is that you're looking for out there. What are you running from? My dad. Then write about it. Let that pain become your inspiration. I have some stuff I need to sort out. And I deal with it the only way I know how. And that's to write a song. You hungry? I set the table. What is this? I want to make things right. <laughs> you and me. My dad was a monster. And I saw God transform him. You have a gift. Real gift. I didn't think that God could do that. And so I wrote this song for my dad. My dad was a monster, and I saw God transform him. What does God want to transform in your life? What's the pain that comes in your past, perhaps, that you've said, oh, it's been hard. It's something you even want to try to get away from. What is that? Because God wants to use that pain in your life, just like he did, has done for Bart, like he did for Saul in his life. God wants to transform our world through us. So what is it that God wants to use in you? And will you let him use it for his purposes? Will you let him transform you? and make a difference for somebody else. In fact, will you do that even as you get ready for Easter? Do you believe in the resurrection? Have you encountered the risen Christ? Then share the story of what Jesus Christ has done for you because there is a Saul waiting around the corner that you're supposed to share with. That God wants to make the difference through you and what he's done for you. And all you got to do is share what you've seen and heard, what Jesus has done for you. I'd like us to take a moment right now, and um, you may have something in your life that you say, man, it's painful, it's hurt, and I'm struggling with this, and I need to give it to Jesus. I want to invite you to do that by using the prayer sheet that's inside the worship bulletin. I'm going to take the next few moments just for you to stop and, and, and talk with Jesus. And is there something that's, that's hindering you from, from, from being able to let go of maybe things from your own past? It could, could be something you're facing right now that's just too, too, much, too heavy for you. And you need to just give it to Jesus.